Hello and welcome to Reporters. Today we're heading to the northern border of Europe, a border that Europe shares with Russia, which is becoming an ever more unpredictable and at times menacing neighbour. Well, in this report by Juliette Lacharny, uh, you'll see the threat, uh, the fears around the Baltic Sea. Countries there, of course, have in mind what took place in Ukraine and Crimea at the hands of Vladimir Putin's Russia. So is an invasion around the Baltic Sea a real possibility? Uh, Juliette, you filmed in Estonia and also in Sweden. You can imagine the uh, conditions for that were rather tricky. What was it like? When we left for Estonia, it was difficult to address the question of a Russian threat. A quarter of inhabitants there have Russian origins, and the annexation of Crimea rekindled debates relating to identity. So it was quite a sensitive topic to approach. On the other hand, in Sweden, it was easier to talk about the issue. People talked about Russia freely. However, when we brought up the issue of cybersecurity, again, it wasn't easy finding people to talk to us. Yeah, we can well imagine. Now it's time to watch Juliette's report entitled Cold War 2.0. men, there's no time to waste. The militiamen, all volunteers, are part of the Estonian National Defence League, an organisation linked to the military. This is an attempt to recreate conditions as close to reality as possible. Since the fall of the USSR and the restoration of independence, Estonians remain on their guard against what they call their big neighbour, Russia. 19-year-old Tanal joined the militia last year. He admits the tension is palpable. All the stuff that goes around, like the Russians and with the American China, it's really putting us on our, our high toes. It's not long when uh, I think the bad things will happen and the uh, war may be coming soon. According to their general, an armed conflict with Russia is unlikely. But the war in Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea in 2014 have left a mark, especially among the young. In 2015, the number of new recruits doubled compared to the year before. We're happy that more and more people want to join, especially young people. I think they feel there's quite a level of threats, so they want to contribute and to be sure Estonia stays free, that we can live our normal lives. In Tallinn, the capital, Andres Lember is leading another battle, the War on Information. A member of the National Defence League for the past 30 years, he's also the face of the website Proper Stop. Launched after the war in Ukraine, the platform corrects propaganda and false information, distributed by some Russian media. Often, it begins on social networks. The ladies start to complain, and it's so bad that those aggressive NATO soldiers are here in Estonia, and etc. And after that, uh, the Bolt News, the part of the Kremlin media, uh, picks this uh, social media posting up and make a news here and, and it started to spread in Russian language media. Like it was totally a lie. There was no pretty soldiers on that day and that place. Every day, Andres and his colleagues monitor around 80 Russian outlets. It's like a constant narrative uh, that the NATO is bad and we need to uh, protect uh, Russian people against NATO. And, and it's like on a daily basis, goes on, goes on, goes on, constantly. I would say that uh, Estonian people mostly kind of immune against this uh, virus. <laughs> but yes, the Russian-speaking community here is, is uh, quite foreign. We head to Narva in the east of the country on the border with Russia. It's also home to Estonia's largest ethnic Russian community. Here, nine out of 10 residents speak Russian, including Nadia and her family. 
Both her parents hold a Russian passport. Nadia's mother has been living here for more than 25 years. Her father was born and brought up in Narva during the Soviet times. Neither of them is fluent in Estonian, the national language. I mostly watch Russian channels because my Estonian is very basic. Simple phrases, so I don't understand what the people are saying on the Estonian channels. Russia's annexation of Crimea has strengthened fears in Estonia that the small Baltic state might be next. But Nadia's mother dismisses the idea as inconceivable. It is very strange for me and also painful because Russia is my homeland. I grew up there and I do not see Russia as an aggressor. It hurts me when the people say that. Like many of Nava's residents, Nadia's parents feel Russian at heart but are profoundly attached to Estonia. <laughs> While the economy in Narva is doing much better than in its neighbour Evangorod in Russia, the rate of unemployment is one of the highest in the country. Once neglected, Narva is now in the spotlight. Its cultural scene is flourishing and the city has become a strategic pit stop for state officials, including the president who visited Nadia's school last September. Here she is. She told that... Um Narva doesn't uh, have to uh, become more Estonian city. It doesn't has, have to be changed, but uh, maybe they will just pay more attention to this. For this generation, integration is much smoother than for their parents, even if obstacles remain. But for them, there is no doubt. Their future is here. I don't really want to go to Russia because they have a um, serious and a high level of corruption and um, I don't think it's a really democratic country. So I prefer to stay in European Union. And yet the Russian border is just metres away. Of the one and a half million inhabitants in Estonia, almost a quarter are of Russian origin. In an attempt to encourage integration, the government has turned to local academics, <laughs> including these men and women. Over the next three days, they'll participate in workshops designed to teach them about Estonia's defence system, but also how to counter external propaganda. I think it's important to obtain information related to our neighbour because we don't always know how to decipher the truth from what's false in the political discourse. We head south, 200 kilometres from Narva to the town of Tartu, to meet Grigory Senkiv. Thanks to his help, the workshops, originally in Estonian, have been available in Russian for the past three years. On the agenda today, a lesson on disinformation and a visit to the military base to meet the armed forces. The Russian propaganda is trying to convince us that the Estonian army is weak and behind the times. So our goal here is to show them that it is modern, in order to put an end to the myth. Grigori knows that by itself, the Estonian army would be quickly defeated in the event of a Russian invasion. But as a member of NATO, Estonia can count on the support of the alliance. The risk of military escalation in Europe may be relatively low, but Russia is also accused of conducting hybrid warfare, a war of disinformation and cyber attacks. In digitally advanced Sweden, cybersecurity has become a national priority. In 2016, the head of the intelligence service confirmed that most of the hacking comes from Russia. That same year, nine of the leading national newspapers were targeted by a massive cyber attack. 
among those hacked, this media outlet in the west of the country. For us, it was a, a big wake-up call. I mean, that there was a threat was nothing new to us. Uh, but obviously, uh, uh, it was possible to, to take us down. Sweden faces an average of 300 cyber attacks every year. We have seen other cyber attacks uh, uh, too during the last couple of, uh, of years, but it has, it has been hard to establish who was actually behind. But in August last year, the website BuzzFeed made headlines when it published a US diplomatic cable pointing the finger at Russia, implying the attack was part of a campaign to sow disinformation about NATO. The newspapers were targeted using DDoS, one of the most efficient and simple ways to paralyze a server. What you can see here, are the attacks, DDoS attacks, from yesterday. Um, so you can see that the attacks are coming from Egypt to Colombia, for example. Wait, it's, it's moving too fast. Base Farm, a specialist in cybersecurity and the host provider of one of the outlets, admits that identifying the hackers is close to impossible. The source of the attack that you can see is not actually the attacker in most cases. They are using uh, computers that are infected by viruses. To, to conduct the attack against the target. So it's extremely hard to find out who was the one actually doing the attack. But it's difficult to remove Moscow from the list of suspects. The secret service in Sweden has said that Russia, Russia, China and Iran are the three major forces when it comes to attacks in Sweden. Relations between Stockholm and Moscow are extremely tense, largely because the Swedish government supported sanctions against Russia following the annexation of Crimea. For its part, Moscow has increased the number of its exercises and military manoeuvres in the Baltic Sea, which has led Sweden to boost its military budget for the first time in 20 years and remilitarise the island of Gotland a strategic point in the heart of the Baltic. The last garrison was dismantled in 2005. Everything needs to be rebuilt. These buildings now erected here will be stores for the armoured vehicles and the tanks and behind us barracks for the soldiers. The country has also reintroduced military conscription. Since 2018, 4,000 young men and women have been called up for service. Among them, Victor and Gordon. Next summer, they'll leave the island to serve for 10 months. I think it's a great thing. Uh, though a lot of other friends and, you know, obviously they're not happy. I'd say it's like a 50-50. A few months ago, like all Swedes, they received a leaflet outlining the measures to take in the event of a crisis. It came like out of nowhere and they could like send the, like the wrong message that uh, we are about to join a war or something like that. Could, could send those messages, but uh, as far as I know, we, we're not currently at war, so. But the war of nerves has already begun. The remilitarization of the island could be seen as provocative by Moscow. And Sweden is taking no chances. The one who have got them have the ability to influence uh, the sea and airways within the region. Uh, so it's, you can decide who will fly in the area and who will uh, go by ship in the area. Sweden promised itself an era of peace, but now finds it has to defend itself. The spectre of a new Cold War is looming over the Baltic. Well, let's get more now with the uh, journalist who filmed that report, Juliette Lacharnay. Uh, Juliette, um, is there a real threat here of a, a full-blown military conflict, do you think, or is this more of a, a fear, a, a fantasy? Oui, en fait... Uh... When you watch this report, you realise that the military threat is low, but high-ranking officials in Estonia told us you mustn't underestimate the threat. Estonia is in a particular position. Its relations with Russia have been contentious for a very long time. 
It was a part of the Russian Empire, then the USSR, so the notion of a Russian threat, the fear of invasion, isn't new at all. It's why many people are very suspicious of what they call the big neighbor. They also predicted what would happen in Ukraine. We met with the commander of the Estonian Defence League. Take a listen. We, we knew it. We felt that the Russian threat is always persistent. It's always uh, existing. So the, what happened in Ukraine didn't come, unlike to other many countries, it didn't come for us as a surprise. So we were sort of expecting, we were expecting something of that kind, we didn't know where. But it proved to be that um, our prediction was, was correct. Now, Juliette, you also filmed on the island of Gotland in Sweden, which has been very much in the spotlight surrounding this whole affair. Um, what does it tell us about the situation more globally? It's true that the island of Gotland is representative of Swedish fears. If you look at their geographical situation, well, it's an island that's situated just 300 kilometers away from the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad. That's where they have missiles with an estimated 500 kilometers in range. The worst scenario for NATO and its military partners such as Sweden would be if Russia invades Scotland with the goal of reaching the Baltic states. That would really be a new element of destabilization in the region. All right, thank you very much indeed, uh, Juliette Lacharnay, there with uh, your fascinating report. That's it for reporters, but do stay tuned to France 24. Plenty more coming up for you.